Hi everyone. Good morning and thanks for joining us for this webinar on feminist perspectives on sex work, challenging power, sharing power, and shifting power. And we're very excited that you're here um, virtually and have been flexible. We've adapted this event from what had been a CSW parallel event and then those were canceled. So we wanted to do something online. And a number of the panelists we anticipated couldn't travel to New York, so we don't quite have the same level of regional diversity we would have otherwise had. But we're happy to be here, and given the situation, wanted to do our best to come together, even if that means coming together online. Um, we're also thankful to uh, UNDP for, um, for having the only seeming room where people can gather still <laughs> in New York. Uh, I'm Carrie Eiser, a policy advisor at Amnesty International, which is a member of SWIFA, the Sex Worker Inclusive Feminist Alliance. And today's event is sponsored by the Global Network of Sex Work Projects and the Sex Worker Inclusive Feminist Alliance. And we're here together exploring how feminist principles motivate our work. And the struggles fought by feminist movements and sex worker rights movements are similar. We're both fighting for the same principles of bodily autonomy and integrity, freedom from violence, and discrimination, among others. But the movements are often pitted against each other to the detriment of both, like both um, movements and to human rights. So our panel today is including representatives of feminist and sex worker organizations and uh, highlights how we're working collectively to resist repressive laws and policies and attacks on our human rights and explore how working together can advance gender equality and social justice for all of us. So we have um, five speakers today. I'll give just a one-line um, a one-line bio of them, and then more information should be available online for the full bio. Um, after each person, each of the five speakers speaks, we'll take questions from the audience, and you can submit your questions virtually through the link on the invitation. So please stay muted and please keep your video off. To simplify things, given the number of participants, we'll just take the questions uh, written. And then uh, I also wanted to mention that we're making this event, um, we're recording it, so hopefully it'll be available to an even larger number of participants afterwards. So I think that's all the, um, the housekeeping, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so the first speaker now will be um, Susanna Freed. Susanna is a senior advisor um, for global programs for CREA and a fellow at the Global Health Justice Partnership at Yale University. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us here. Um, I, I have to say, I think this might be um, a first for me. I am told that um, sex workers do it better, and so I, I appreciate being in, uh, in the company of folks who not only do it better, but do it really well. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I am a senior advisor at CREA. CREA is a Global South-led feminist organization. We're based in India. Um, we work in South Asia, East Africa, the Middle East and North Africa, and globally. We work hard to create a world with our partners and colleagues in which all women, trans, and gender non-conforming people are counted in and given equal recognition and respect. We, we know how much folks are excluded and marginalized and denied access because they transgress social societal norms of gender, sexuality, ability, profession, and are thereby prevented from fully exercising their sexual and human rights. At CREA, through uh, campaigning in public education, feminist leadership, um, cross-movement organizing, we work hard to support sex workers and sex worker rights groups to tell their own stories, helping to create spaces for their own narratives that reflect their own complex realities as sex workers, as family members who may be the primary income earners in their families, and as people of all genders who dream and who have dreams and aspirations for themselves, their families, their communities. These are the everyday struggles of sex workers and others as individuals, but also as collectives taking charge of the public narrative and demanding their rights. 
We are proud to be a member of SWIPA, the Sex Worker Inclusive Feminist Alliance, who is um, sponsoring this event. And with SWIPA, we are committed to building more inclusive feminist movements and supporting local partners to engage in local and national policy processes to activate allies to help increase the visibility of women, trans and gender non-conforming people who are pushed to the margins in advocacy processes and advocacy spaces. And as I said, to ensure a more inclusive and intersectional feminist practice. Um, as a member of SWIFA, we actively support sex workers engagement in global policy venues as we had hoped to be doing at the uh, CSW. As we all know, we are, we are now um, being creative about the ways in which we can continue to occupy public spaces, um, even, even though many of those spaces at the moment are online spaces. And we are um, appreciative of the capacity to do that. Um, and, and I have to say, because a lot of the work we do at CREA is also about ensuring safety and security, including the online spaces, that while we appreciate the opportunity to do that, we also would um, request that everybody take time, especially now as we move more online, to think about how to make sure that your online presence is safe and secure. Um, that's a, as a little aside. Um, as we join forces and speak publicly. Um, I wanted to tell a story about how we engaged in 2016 with UN Women. At the time, UN Women had announced that it was going to draft a policy position on sex work slash prostitution. It was cause for concern because the process was being led by UN Women staff who were known to support criminalization of some or all aspects of sex work and was heavily in influenced by groups that actively seek to abolish sex work. Priya, along with se several sex worker rights organizations like the Global Network of Sex Work Projects, Sangram, Starlet Alliance, a number of folks in this room, initiated a strategic discussion to develop um, a powerful response to you and women. One of the main decisions we made at that time was to draft a joint statement that would be written by women's rights and sex worker rights organizations and, and ultimately by a number of labor rights organizations as well to the UN women articulating the importance of them anchoring any policy in a human rights approach that supported the human rights of sex workers and stressed the importance of decriminalization. Through rather massive outreach, and consultation led by CREA and NSWP, the Global Network of Sex Work Projects. Um, a statement was jointly drafted by approximately 86 sex worker rights, women's rights, and human rights organizations and networks. We submitted that to UN Women with nearly 200 signatory organizations. I should stress that the time frame that we were working in was quite short, and our ability to mobilize that kind of participation, both in terms of the drafting as well as in the signatory, was really a testament to the fact that we had already started building trust and strong relationships and were able to then mobilize that um, in the process of developing what was a really powerful and strong statement and getting um, not just 200 signatories, but really a very diverse number of organizations uh, geographically diverse, but also diverse in terms of the kind of work that they do. We were, we were very gratified about that participation. Um, in addition, as CREA, part of our effort to share and challenge power in that situation, we partnered with the All India Network of Sex Workers, um, the Center for Advocacy and Research, India, and the Lawyers Collective in India, and 43 sex worker-led community-based organizations to draft a joint statement to submit to UN Women coming from sex workers in India. The process included three regional consultations within India um, and again was really grounded in CREA's long relationship of working with sex worker rights groups in India, especially around um, extremely problematic um, anti-trafficking legislation. 
So just to recap about um, how we work to share and challenge power. First, as illustrated in our UN advocacy, we worked and were led by sex worker groups and ally organizations to build a significant collective mobilization, showing the breadth and depth of support by women's rights groups for sex worker rights. And that was particularly important as we understood that for UN women, the first constituency they think about is women's rights and feminist organizations. And we wanted, um, we wanted to make sure that that was a very strong and powerful, that there was a strong and powerful presence of women's rights and feminist organizations um, affirming strongly their support for sex worker rights and their view that that was something that you and women needed to be doing too. Second, we work to ensure strong represent representation from community-led organizations like the All India Network of Sex Workers. And third, we activated high-level influencers who we knew would speak powerfully as sex worker rights advocates to UN women's leadership. And that, the, the using those three strategies together was quite powerful and ultimately UN women decided not to move forward with that policy position. However, I have to share a little epilogue. Um, in November 2019, um, Coming under an enormous amount of pressure, the UN Women Executive Director unfortunately stated, we are aware of the different positions and concerns on the issue of prostitution sex work and are attentive to the important views of all concerned. Um, she wrote, UN Women has taken a neutral position on this issue. Um, so whereas before they had uh, taken a position uh, supporting uh, supporting mobilization for decriminalization. They said they would no longer do that. Um, and this statement also superseded their earlier night note saying it would use the terms sex work and sex workers um, and recognize the right of all sex workers to choose their work or to leave it and to have access to other employment opportunities. So I end with that epilogue, but also with this mobilization here to say we are uh, we are paying attention, we are mobilizing, we are active, and we will continue to advance in local policy venues and national spaces and local and community spaces that the sex worker rights are human rights um, and for the decriminalization of sex work um, in, in every aspect of sex work. Thanks very much, and again, thank you all for joining us today. <laughs> Great, thank you, Susanna. Uh, so the next speaker we have um, now is Karina Bravo. Karina is uh, representing Plapert and the Colectivo Flor Gazelia from Ecuador. Thank you. Bueno, buenos días. Eh, buenos días de, por esta invitación y también a agradecer a NSWF eh, de estar representando a Latinoamérica, especialmente a la plataforma de personas que hacen trabajo sexual. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for SWIP and SWP for this invitation to represent Latin America and uh, people who engage with sex work in this event. Especialmente nuestra plataforma lucha por los derechos humanos y por los derechos laborales. Esa es nuestra bandera y nuestra lucha. Y en esa lucha hemos ido encontrando puntos de encuentro con las organizaciones feministas. Y es así que en 1998, justo cuando estaba todo el auge de la lucha de las trabajadoras del sexo, se creó un programa que se llamaba La Sala. Un espacio especialmente para las trabajadoras trabajar el tema de derechos, de fin, de empoderamiento. Um, our platform advocates for uh, human rights and labor rights. And it was in this struggle for these two approaches that we we had we encountered meeting points with the feminist movements in Ecuador, and this happened specifically starting in 1998. Uh, after the sex work movement started in Ecuador, we had a project called La Sala which was a space of um, a dropping center where sex workers could discuss their empowerment, their self-esteem, and to discuss the rights they were entitled to. 
Y fue así que comenzaron a acercarse a este programa algunas mujeres feministas a querer saber qué estábamos haciendo de trabajadora, qué es lo que hablábamos ahí. Y yo tenía mucha curiosidad de saber qué hacíamos en ese espacio. Lo que permitió que ellas comiencen a participar con nosotros, comiencen a mirarnos y comencemos a mirar cuáles son los puntos de encuentro que teníamos, primero como mujeres, luego por esa gran lucha frente al patriarcado, al estigma y la discriminación que vivíamos por ser mujeres, luego por ser trabajadoras del sexo. So, as this space, it was when feminists started to engage with us because they were curious to know about our struggle, about our rights, about what we were advocating for. And they started to participate in our activities and together we started to find meeting points uh, in our uh, struggle against patriarchy and uh, against the violations uh, against sex workers' rights. Y es el primer camino que hicimos a unir con las mujeres buenas y las mujeres malas, el de poder participar dentro de los movimientos de mujeres feministas, e inclusive reconociendo que las primeras organizaciones feministas hemos sido las organizaciones de trabajadores del sexo. Ok, and, and through this way, we managed to unite bad women and good women. And uh, we even got the recognition from the feminists that actually our sex worker led organization was the first feminine, actually, first feminist organization in Ecuador. Y fue en el 2000 que comenzamos a unirnos para armar algunas estrategias frente a algunos reclamos que teníamos los trabajadores sexuales al sistema de salud, un sistema de salud discriminatorio, estigmatizante, que solo miraba el tema de la vagina solo haciéndonos ver como vagina, no una salud integral, obligándonos inclusive a decir que había una pandemia de hepatitis, obligándonos a poner una vacuna y reteniéndonos la tarjeta de salud si no nos ponía. Ok, but it was in 2000 that we effectively started working on specific strategies um, about some uh, sex workers' claims um, of a bad horse for health services, for quality health services. Uh, at the time, we claimed that the health services providers treated us with a lot of discrimination and stigma. Uh, the approach from, from the health system uh, in regards to sex workers were very, was very reducive to our vagina. They didn't consider that we had a very wide and uh, universal needs. And at the time, they were forcing us to take vaccines against hepatitis B because they claimed that we were the main responsible for causing an epidemic. Y allí fue que pues, decidimos, decidimos tomarnos esos controles profilácticos discriminatorios y, y armamos toda una estrategia, las trabajadoras del sexo con nuestras hermanas y compañeras, mujeres feministas, mientras unas nos tomábamos los servicios de salud, otras trabajadoras del sexo acompañadas con feministas hacían todo el tema de incidencia, abogacía en el Ministerio de Salud, Defensoría del Pueblo, Derecho Humano, Gobernación. Nos organizamos y logramos en nuestro país, en nuestro Ecuador, que se terminen los controles profilácticos y pasar a los servicios de salud como cualquier ciudadana And that's where we decided to take over these discriminatory services. And together with the feminist movement, we started uh, to do advocacy at various government levels, including the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Justice. So they would put a stop to the prophylactic control of sex workers, and they will start to treat us as, a, as female citizens. A partir de ese momento, muchísimas trabajadoras del sexo comenzamos a afiliarnos al movimiento de mujeres feministas, sabiendo que habíamos encontrado puntos de acuerdo y que teníamos aliadas estratégicas, que eso iba a servir para avanzar muchísimas cosas en nuestro derecho. Y comenzamos a luchar por otros derechos. Luego, en el 2006, eh, justo una feminista, mujer feminista, fue la intendente de la provincia 
Y en aquella época todavía las trabajadoras sexuales, cuando nos encontrábamos con Condobo, pues estábamos paradas en la calle, nos arrastraba la policía, nos llevaban de pedida por un mes, y decidimos poder un alto a eso, y luego armamos otra estrategia de cómo hacer que nos lleven detenidas a las líderes y demostrar toda la violencia que ejercía la policía hacia las mujeres trabajadoras sexuales. Y teníamos nuestra aliada, compañía de mujeres afuera, haciendo todo el tema de abogacía, mientras otras éramos detenidas. So, since then, the sex workers in Ecuador realized that the fe uh, making part of the feminist movement was a, a strategy to advance sex workers' rights. And in 2016, uh, we allied ourselves again to stop a series of arbitrary arrests and violation of human rights against sex workers' leaders. So we divided ourselves to the feminist women together, and each one took over different roles, um, making advocacy at the at national level, and at the same time documenting the violence caused by this violation. En el 2006 formamos una mesa de derechos humanos y trabajo sexual conformada por trabajadores de sexo, mujeres feministas y autoridades y a partir de eso fuimos logrando, por ejemplo, darle baja a la policía, que se terminen las famosas batidas y arrestos a los trabajadores del sexo, eh, eh, haciendo muchísimas cosas que fue de impacto y que sirvió para todo el Ecuador, especialmente beneficia a las trabajadoras del sexo. So since since 2016, we have a joint uh, local council with feminist organizations and local government authorities, where we discuss various issues for, uh, around sex work, and including arbitrary arrests and uh, police invasions to sex workers working places. Justo en el 2008 salió una ley. Eh, la ley de maternidad gratuita y haciendo que dentro de esta ley se cumplan los derechos sexuales y reproductivos de las mujeres y fue con el apoyo del movimiento de mujeres que por primera vez las trabajadoras sexuales recibíamos condones, atención en ITS, se nos entrega la copia anticonceptiva, todos los derechos sexuales y reproductivos. So, in, I think the first great achievement of this um, union was that in 2008, there was a, lay, a law passed on uh, a free maternity, and, we, uh, and the law um, uh, stated that the sexual and reproductive rights of all women must be fulfilled, including the distribution of free condoms to sex workers. In 2008, by the movement of women, I was a candidate in our province. And supported by the feminist movement, Karina was uh, launched as a candidate for the local council. En el 2017, eh, hasta la actualidad, soy la coordinadora y representante del movimiento de mujeres feministas en el Ecuador, Machala. Y desde ahí hemos venido este, luchando muchas cosas juntas, los casos de femicidio de trabajadoras sexuales, donde hemos tenido sentencia de compañeras que han sido asesinadas cruelmente por el machismo. Y uh, desde um, 2017, ella es en realidad la representante feminista uh, representative a estas uh, local council instances, where they've been fighting against cases of feminicides against sex workers. Toda esta trayectoria y lucha y estar juntas peleando por muchísimas cosas y puntos en común ha hecho que las mujeres buenas y las mujeres malas vayamos cerrando esa brecha que nos separa y encontrar puntos en común, que es los derechos sexuales y reproductivos, contra el machismo y el patriarcado y el estigma, contra la violencia que cada vez nos afecta más a las mujeres y a las niñas especialmente a las personas que ejercemos trabajo sexual. Participamos en mesas de coordinación y representación como mujeres trabajadoras del sexo y como parte de mujeres feministas. So, this is the traje trajectory um, how we actually managed to find various meeting points with the feminist movements and to reduce the gap 
It currently separates the bad women from the good women, which are mainly centered on sexual and reproductive rights, uh, the fight against sexism, against the stigma, against the violence that continues to affect all of us women, especially women who, under, who undertake sex work. And through the participation, through the political participation at these local coordination councils, we've been able to uh, undertake several advocacy actions. Una de las cosas que hemos entendido con las compañeras feministas nos une el ser mujer, nos une el ser ciudadana con derecho y nos une muchísimas cosas como es el tema de la violencia que también nos afecta como mujer. Yes. So we keep um, stating with the fe along with the feminists that what unites unites us is that we are all citizens with rights and that we need to fight the violence that affects us all. Y por último quiero decir que la gran cosa que nos ha unido es respetar la decisión que hemos tomado sobre nuestro cuerpo y respetar también que lo que hemos decidido es hacer un trabajo y mirarnos de igual a igual con respeto. And lastly, the great thing that unites us is the respect for the decision on what we do with our body and also the decision about what kind of work we do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, that was wonderful. <laughs> so next, uh, next I want to introduce, we have Koli, who's amazing. Koli is um, here from the African Sex Worker Alliance and Susanke from South Africa. Hi everyone and thank you for having me. My name is Kulu Chalese. I'm already being introduced. I'm the national coordinator and the founding member of the National Sex Worker Movement in South Africa. The one and only that is advocating for the demonization of adult sex work in South Africa. Um, I am the board member of ASWA, also um, the member of ASWA and the member of NSWP. As as you saw, I'm not just not in my sense. Um, Today, I would like to talk to you about uh, movement building, which that speaks to the, um, the, the challenging power and the shifting um, power and also sharing power. Within our movement, we are the group of uh, sex workers that is uh, plus minus 3,000 members um, currently now. The reason for the movement was formed. It was due to the challenges that sex workers are facing. Uh, in the country, which is uh, similar to other uh, challenges that uh, uh, sex workers are facing in other countries. So, we then decided to form this movement because sex workers were tired of being uh, exploited by managers, by um, brothel owners, and uh, also human rights abuse that they face from the police officers that are uh, the ones that are supposed to be protecting sex workers. So that's the purpose where the movement was formed then to date. Uh, we are existing since 2003. What I would like to share with you today uh, is the importance of um, the inclusive and the meaningful of sex workers in such spaces. Um, for an example, we are part of the SGD coalition in South Africa. We are the steering committee member of SGD. We are also um, a member of SGD. SGG meaning we're not turning back. It is the coalition that comprises um, sex workers, advocates, uh, lawyers to advocate for uh, law reform on decriminalization of other sex workers in South Africa. It also comprises of the uh, human rights defenders in South Africa. In that space, um, that's where uh, sex workers are more inclusive in terms of challenging laws also because the laws that they are being challenged are actually are about sex workers. So then sex workers are part and parcel of that process. So it is the space of also where uh, 74 organizations that are part and parcel of that, it's a bigger coalition in South Africa, um, that um, the organization have gathered together in realizing that how much uh, human rights violation and the abuses that the sex workers are facing uh, in South Africa. So it is in the space that is useful to us because it also gives us as, as uh, sex workers a voice and also to input on how can we advocate for change in South Africa. The movement itself, 
um, has been advocating for change in South Africa. We've worked with various organizations individually because the purpose of the movement it is to make sure that we create the voice of sex workers so that the, um, sex workers can have uh, someone to, to lean on if the potential challenges that they're facing. As you are aware, that in South Africa, uh, uh, sex work is criminalized and the, the sell and the buy is criminalized. That then uh, leaves sex workers actually in the system of being exploited by even the um, law reform and uh, also police officers that should be protecting sex workers. So then as we see, so okay, uh, we work with self-identified sex workers, people that have take and made decision, decision by themselves to be in the sex industry. Um, we then become a, a middle person because we have created also a network out of sex work, uh, I mean, out of Sisonke as a movement with partners that work with relevant specific needs for sex workers, for example, healthy, uh, human rights, uh, beyond uh, 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 sex work issues and needs because the sex workers also are parents and mothers and their family members also that are taking responsibility to make sure that they provide for their families. All they need is protection. So the role that as a soldier that we are playing, we then um, refer sex workers to the service providers because as a movement, our focus is to build a movement in South Africa so that the sex workers have a voice because we believe that um, if we work hand in hand uh, with organizations, also with other feminist organizations, uh, feminist movement, uh, it is important that we together we stand because I believe that it divided we fall. So we also believe that I am a feminist myself as a sex worker. Um, so I strongly believe that in such spaces of feminism, it is important that the sex workers are being included so that they can also contribute because as I said earlier on, that the issues that sex workers are facing are not only sex work issues, beyond issues that they're facing as, as women. And also I would uh, touch based on um, how have we been uh, part and parcel of the civil society spaces, because I also believe that in South Africa, those are also spaces that should be inclusive and meaningful spaces for sex workers to be part and parcel. We have been recognized as a sector uh, since 2011, um, since then, there has been a lot of change that has been made. There's been a lot of implementation in terms of making sure that sex workers um, healthy access are uh, easily accessible. Recently, um, let me just start by saying, um, 2015, we have launched the, the, national, uh, plan, the national HIV plan for sex workers in South Africa uh, by the president. Previously, he was the deputy and chair of the civil society forum. Um, we're having that plan in place, it has then given us also an agency to make sure that as sex workers we are part and parcel in fighting the HIV epidemic, because those are all issues that sex workers are facing due to the criminal system law. Um, recently, we have launched um, the South African National um, Human Rights Plan. It was launched by the um, Deputy, I mean, the Minister of uh, Health and also the Deputy Minister of Justice was part and parcel of that. Me being the co-chair, and it's led by, um, it's chaired by the key population. Uh, one of uh, my co-chair is from the LGBTI community, and I'm from the sex work sector community. When we talk about the inclusive and the sharing of power and challenging power, I think those are things that for me, they stood up because then it makes me also to be part and parcel of solving whatever uh, problems that it is uh, um, uh, attached to the work that we as a sex workers are advocating for. Meaning that if um, the sex workers are problem or anything that it has to do with sex workers problem, sex workers should be part and parcel of that solution to solve the problem. Um, it is a, a, a plan, a comprehensive response a, a, to human rights related to barriers to HIV and savings and gender equality and gender e e e equality. So it has also given us um, an opportunity to be part and parcel of that plan when it was being crafted. So um, you can also maybe look for it online, I think on the South African AIDS uh, National Forum, uh, SALAC, you will be able to get that uh, 
uh, plan. So those are some of the important uh, purposes of sex workers to be part and parcel of all the structures in making sure that we share in power and also in making sure that we shift in power and also to making sure that we challenge in power. Because as women, I think it is important that uh, we are given that platform to be able to you know, um, advocate and also to participate in any um, form of implementation in changing uh, challenges that we are facing as, as women in, in the country, regardless of our occupation. Um, and lastly, I would highlight why sex workers want uh, uh, the decriminalization of adult sex work. It is because um, the current system it is exploiting and exposing as exposes sex workers, also denying sex workers of their rights. Um, we believe that the call of uh, a decriminalization of adult sex work it will advance uh, advance the sex workers' rights. It will also reduce the stigma and uh, unfair uh, discrimination. It will also reduce the level of gender-based violence. It will also reduce the prevalence of HIV and AIDS and STI. It will also improve and increase uh, access to services and justice uh, legal system. It will also create a safer space uh, for sex workers to be able to um, report uh, concerns and issues that they're facing uh, in the working environment. It will also create a safer space for society to respect sex workers as agents and, 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 and disease, uh, on, on diseases that they have made. It will also create um, a safer space and willingness to, to obtain legal resources and for human rights violation when it comes to sex workers. Lastly, it will also give sex workers an opportunity to be able to fight uh, exploitation of the underage because sex workers are parents, are mothers, they are sisters, they are brothers. So therefore, I believe that uh, the meaningful the meaning and the inclusive of sex workers in changing all the issues that we're facing in our countries, regionally, globally, nationally, it will be important. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next speaker we have now is Jules Kim. Jules is from the Asia Pacific Network of Sex Workers and the Scarlet Alliance, based from Australia and Korea. Thanks. Hi. Um, I just want to divert a little bit from my um, plan to talk just to um, respond to the UN women position saying that if they're, they're taking a neutral position on sex work. I find that quite alarming that they're talking about the removal of our rights and state sanction violence against sex workers as a neutral position. Decriminalisation is a neutral position. Uh, it is an evidence-based technical recommendation that, uh, that recognises that this is the best model of sex industry regulation. It doesn't require you to support sex work. It just uh, requires you to acknowledge the evidence and uh, recognise that it is uh, there is a mountain of evidence to support that it, it is definitively proven from a human rights perspective, from a labour rights perspective, and a public health uh, perspective that it is the best model of regulation for not just sex workers but for also for the general community. So. Back to the talk. Um, in terms of uh, what I wanted to touch a bit about, I, I have the privilege of living and working in one of the few places in the world that is actually decriminalised. And uh, we also had uh, successfully advocated, had a sex worker led um, campaign to uh, implement um, uh, decriminalisation in the Northern Territory. Um, in, in Australia. Unfortunately, it's still only the third jurisdiction in the world uh, that decriminalises sex work. Often uh, when I'm speaking on panels or uh, speaking with um, people, abolitionists or anti-sex work, uh, there's a, a, a tendency to conflate decriminalisation and legalisation. And I just want to speak a bit about the difference between those two frameworks. So, um, in Australia, we are regulated state by state, so we have different regulations state by state. So it gives us um, an opportunity. It's a bit of a nightmare for sex workers, but it does give us an opportunity to see the impact of the different um, types of regulations. Um, so in, in uh, licensing or uh, 
legalisation is probably more accurately described as over-regulation. The problem is, in, in, for many of us in our lives, police are uh, a, a, an issue for sex workers. And in fact, in New South Wales, uh, which was the first jurisdiction in the world to decriminalise sex work, it was because of the widespread police corruption in the sex industry that um, decriminalisation was implemented. Uh, unfortunately, when uh, sex work is legalised, it means the police are still regulating the sex industry. Uh, it means that there are a really narrow set of laws in which sex workers can legally operate, which creates a two-tiered industry where the majority of sex workers are unable to comply with the onerous uh, regulations that, required, that are required of you to operate legally. What we find is uh, that there is increased stigma and discrimination because it actually exceptionalises sex work in, uh, with a set of um, unworkable laws, such as registration, for example. Uh, in, in countries, for example, in Australia, in jurisdictions where we do have um, legalisation or licensing, uh, registration, your name is on a register for life. Uh, in fact, you can't ever get that removed even after you die. Uh, so it is actually on a permanent register with no opportunity to ever have yourself removed from that register. It gets brought up in completely unrelated ways. So we've had many sex workers talking to us about how their sex work record, even after they've you know, they might have worked for a week um, legally uh, and because they're on that register 20 years later, they can come up in a child custody case or it will, it will come up in completely unrelated um, ways and be used against you and creating barriers for you to actually leave the sex industry if you want to or get another job. So, in fact, it actually traps people and um, is more than actually providing any benefits to sex workers, it just brands you for life uh, with uh, stigma and discrimination and um, a removal of your rights. There's also, uh, it criminalises acts that are lawful for non-sex workers, um, for sex workers. So for example, um, condoms are used as evidence um, against sex workers, Police will pretend to be either sex workers or clients to entrap sex workers and ask for illegal acts and, in fact, kind of create a, a demand for that in, in a way to trap sex workers and to arrest them. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it might involve like mandatory medical testing, which has been proven to be uh, complete, a, a, a violation of sex workers' human rights for a start and also quite useless from a public health perspective. And it, it, by contrast, when uh, sex work is decriminalised, it removes police as the regulators of the sex industry and it repeals criminal laws that are specific to the sex industry. It, 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 it regulates sex industry businesses through standard planning, business or industrial codes. And it doesn't single out sex workers for specific regulation. But that doesn't mean that there is no regulation. So that the laws uh, still apply to sex workers and to the sex industry like they do to everybody else. So criminal laws still apply. Decriminal identification doesn't put us outside the law. Uh, it uh, doesn't create new laws for sex workers and it doesn't leave sex workers behind. And I think that's really important and what um, as we're um, implementing decriminalisation in the Northern Territory, it's just all the, the access to the same protections that everyone takes for granted um, are now actually available for sex workers. So not only are we no longer targeted by uh, laws, um, unfair laws against us, it also means that if a sex worker is a victim of a crime or uh, faces violence against them or uh, you know, uh, might have a workplace violation, they're able to access those same protections like every other uh, citizen. So um, I wanted to talk a bit about sharing power and one of the examples that, um, uh, and uh, it should be noted as well that we had really strong support um, from feminist organisations like the true feminist organisations in uh, the campaign for decriminalisation in the Northern Territory and um, 
it was really important to have the support of the unions and um, from from women uh, organisations recognising that this was actually a labour rights, human rights, and, and a women's rights issue. But um, I'm going to talk a bit about our experience in um, a, a sex worker-led anti-trafficking program um, and uh, the, the role that, um, that feminists help to play in changing that policy in Australia. So at the, uh, when uh, the trafficking laws first came in, um, into Australia, um, in, in 2004. It was it solely focused on the sex industry. In fact, the laws themselves were named like sexual servitude um, in the sex industry. Uh, the, the, the trafficking investigation team was actually called the Transnational Sexual Exploitation uh, and Trafficking Team. So in fact, the, the, the entire purview of the trafficking response was all, almost 100% on the sex industry and was about um, uh, I suppose, um, migration and uh, sex work compliance um, rather than actually addressing uh, issues of trafficking. And that's not to say that there weren't issues that migrant sex workers were facing and issues of um, exploitation um, and issues of workplace um, violations that they were facing. But unfortunately, the only avenue that people had to access them was through this anti-trafficking framework, which is also incredibly difficult to access. So you could only get support through the trafficking framework if you were willing to be a police witness. And uh, so in a way, like we would have these investigations where it would be like 10 police officers and immigration officials coming into sex industry workplaces. And repeatedly we were hearing from um, Asian brothels in the context of Australia was mainly like Asian brothels that were targeted. Um, and uh, like they were routinely coming in there like maybe 10, 12 times a month. So it was a, a concerted harassment of uh, migrant sex worker workplaces. And supposedly, while these 20 police and immigration officials are in your workplace, if you're somebody that was actually experiencing trafficking or exploitation, that you would feel safe enough to actually approach these people and say, I've been trafficked. Um, unfortunately, it also had this framework where if you admitted to being a willing sex worker, then you would be supported. Or if you say that you were being trafficked and agreed to testify, then you had the potential to get a visa, you know, um, some funds and housing, English lessons. So there was a kind of incentive to, uh, I suppose, respond to a certain narrative, which was really unfortunate. And it really created a situation that made it very difficult to deal with actual workplace exploitation issues and deal with the issues that migrant sex workers were facing because it, it placed this false narrative and uh, problematic framework in which you had to abide by in order to get support. Uh, we successfully managed to advocate to get funding for a migrant sex worker led uh, program um, as uh, to, uh, through the funding um, for anti-trafficking. And uh, in fact, it was interesting because in the 20 plus years that I've been working um, as a sex worker activist, the amount of opposition that we, and we always have opposition, but the amount of opposition, the fact that there was an organisation of migrant sex workers that were helping other migrant sex workers was completely offensive to people. And uh, we were in the media and we uh, were constantly attacked. The funders, uh, that which was the Australian government, um, were uh, constantly campaigned to defund us. Um, it was quite remarkable. But uh, fortunately, um, and uh, we were pulled up at, um, in Parliament uh, to uh, talk about why this funding was useful and why we should continue to be funded. Fortunately, we were actually incredibly successful uh, in uh, actually being able to assist uh, 
people that were experiencing exploitation. So if actually people came to us and were seeking support, we wouldn't um, immediately say, you need to leave the sex industry. It was like, what are the issues that you're facing? It might be, um, I hadn't been paid my wages. I was told that I was given paid too much and I wasn't given my wages. So really, it's for that person, it's not that they want to leave the sex industry. They want to be paid their wages for their work that they've done. So that's the issue that they're presenting with. Um, it might be actually that they've had their passport taken. So, you know, actually they want to get their passport and they might want to uh, go back home. So it's actually finding out what are the issues that the people are facing instead of trying to force it into this false narrative of a, of a, a trafficking program. Um, and we, uh, it, it was really great because we did have allies. It was a, a, a lawyer's association. Uh, that uh, provides the support and pro bono needs the support because unfortunately if we did try and refer people to the free trafficking legal support immediately they had to call the police and the police had to be involved and, in order to get that support. So it was really fantastic that we had this um, uh, women's um, legal organisation that was willing to provide us with pro bono uh, legal advice so that people knew what their choices were and what their rights were and uh, could make a decision about how they wanted to respond. And sometimes it was prosecution, sometimes they did want to go to court, but actually they should have the right to make that decision um, about how they want to respond to this situation. Sometimes people just wanted to go home. Sometimes they just wanted to go to another workplace, or otherwise they just wanted to be paid, you know. So it was depending on what that issue was. Fortunately, it was really essential for us having um, other organisations and um, other women's organisations saying that this is an approach that's working and, and it, this organisation needs to continue to be funded and needs to continue to do their work because the opposition was so huge and we were constantly having to battle um, these people that were trying to get us defunded. So this is why it was so essential for us to have allies also say, look, they are actually doing good work because unfortunately, no matter how many times sex workers say that, it's, it's not heard all the time. So it was um, essential to have other um, organisations um, not only supporting us in conducting the program but also supporting us publicly in ensuring that the problem, uh, that the program was um, maintained. Uh, we actually successfully managed to um, get some law reform so now it's not sex trafficking it's uh, labour trafficking and sex workers are included in the labour trafficking framework. Sexual servitude in the sex industry is now just called servitude. Um, the, the laws have changed now the, tra the sexual exploitation and trafficking team is called the human trafficking team and uh, it's uh, now that there's been a lot of reframing and um, within I think by the fifth year of the program for the first year, we saw cases of trafficking um, exceed in other industries exceeding those in the sex industry. So they started kind of looking into other places as well. So it was an incredibly successful uh, program and, and it demonstrates the importance of sex work and led responses in trafficking, the importance of support um, for our efforts in addressing trafficking um, against sex work. Thanks, Jules. Um, so I just wanted to uh, remind people that if you have questions, now is a very good time to submit them. And there's um, a link to the web form in the email you received last night. So hopefully you can find that. If anyone has trouble as a backup, you could um, perhaps use the chat function. Um, so now I'll introduce uh, the last speaker before we'll move to the question. And that's Sebastian Cohn. Sebastian is the project director at the Open Society Foundation Public Health Program. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to try to do two things today. Uh, first, I want to um, explain why the Open Society Foundation supports sex worker rights, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we aspire to, uh, to do that. Uh, and I hope that that will speak to the themes of uh, this webinar, so challenging, sharing, and shifting power. 
Um, let me start with the, the, the why. Um, I actually rare, feel like I rarely get a, an opportunity to talk about the connection between OSF's kind of core mission and sex worker rights, so I appreciate this opportunity. Um, many of you will know that OSF is a global grant-making uh, organization. Um, our core mission is to promote and defend open societies, which means that everything we do as an institution, everything we fund uh, and advocate for should be justifiable in those terms. Um, open societies are pluralistic societies where freedom of thought and freedom of expression uh, and democratic participation are paramount. Um, the opposite of open societies are closed societies that are often characterized by authoritarianism, um, intolerance, and a, and, and a relative lack of critical thinking, uh, and an excessive respect for traditional values and mores, uh, even when they hurt people. Um, so in that sense, open societies are also necessarily feminist societies. Um, challenging um, authoritarian power is crucial to our mission of advancing uh, open societies. Um, and we're seeing authoritarian power isn't just an issue in, in sort of undemocratic societies. Uh, even relatively open societies can have authoritarian tendencies in the sense of limiting civil liberties for certain groups. Um, and perceptions and policies of sex work, I think, really, really goes to show that. Um, so what are some of the, the authoritarian tendencies with respect to sex work? Um, I'd highlight, for example, uh, patriarchal and, paterni and paternalistic suppression of sex worker voices insisting that sex workers cannot or should not speak for themselves is an authoritarian tendency. Um, unwillingness to critically consider research and evidence and to tailor, and tailor policy accordingly is an authoritarian tendency. Uh, the rejection of sex workers on moral grounds is an authoritarian tendency. And sort of dogmatic utopianism, so for example, the idea that sex work can be eradicated through criminalization is also an authoritarian tendency. Um, an open society, on the, on the contrary, invites the participation of sex workers in our democracies. It values the knowledge of sex workers in policymaking about sex work. Uh, and an open society challenges sort of simplistic and moralistic ideas about who sex workers are and what sex work is. So for these reasons, um, I feel like the, the fight for sex worker rights is also a fight for open societies and against uh, authoritarian power. Let me uh, talk briefly about the how. So how does OSF aspire to support sex worker rights? Um, OSF began supporting efforts uh, around sex worker health uh, sometime around 2001. Uh, and our approach has evolved over time, and I'm sure will inevitably continue to evolve. Um, and although it wasn't necessarily where we started, today uh, sex worker leadership is crucial in our understanding of how sex worker rights uh, are, are, are best promoted and protected. So uh, in practice, that means that a significant majority of the organizations and projects that we support are led by sex workers or people who have uh, lived experiences that include sex work. Um, for OSF, this emphasis on um, sex worker leadership is in part about shifting power, but it's in part also about living up to our uh, feminist and open society uh, values. In addition to um, supporting uh, sex worker-led organizations directly, uh, OSF also participated in the creation of the Red Umbrella Fund, which is a pooled fund that several donors contribute to, uh, and where sex workers make grant decisions uh, and have a majority on the governance board. So as a, as a grant-making foundation, our goal is also to provide um, 
flexible funding whenever possible uh, and appropriate. So this means that we uh, trust organizations to set their own priorities and strategies and to change those when necessary. And this too, uh, in my mind, is about living our uh, feminist and open society values. I mean, I, I don't, I, I think I'll, I'll close on this and I don't wanna suggest that shifting power in philanthropy is, is easy and in many ways, the very existence of philanthropy as we know it today is a consequence of patriarchy and inequalities and capitalism. And I don't want to suggest that supporting sex work and leadership and giving up power sort of in small ways will tear down these bigger structures that, that underpin much of philanthropy. But I do think they, they can go uh, some way towards doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So um, that's the end. The end of the speaker presentations. Now we're moving to the, the questions. And um, yeah, I just wanted to say how how interesting it was to hear from everyone in following the theme of challenging power, sharing power, shifting power. We saw challenging power from the standpoint of whether that's doing international advocacy or working on local legal change. We saw sharing power from the standpoint of movements coming together, whether feminist right, feminist movements, women, women's rights, um, unions, and then um, us all working towards shifting power from the standpoint of getting to a place where you know, sex workers' human rights are protected and we build more, um, more inclusive and intersectional feminist movements. So the questions that have come in so far are, are questions that are along the lines of how do we you know, move forward and promote that agenda? So the first question for the speakers, and I think um, everyone who wants to can answer this one, is what do you see as the main challenge for sex workers in building alliances with feminists? Um, I'll jump into that. <laughs> uh, because of the experience that uh, previously I've uh, I've heard from my colleagues and also I've experienced. I think the challenge is um, because it, some feminist movements, they tend to believe that every person who's in the sex industry is trafficked, which is not true. Um, so because of not uh, speaking the same language or in that understanding, um, I think then that's where the problem lies, which I believe that um, uh, shifting power and that kind of for the relationship between if it were to be happen or allowed to create you know the space of sex workers to be meaningful and inclusive in those spaces we can then be able to connect and give the correct information and not to say um they are not people that are trafficked but also i think it is important to look at at the bigger picture as a country at the global level at the regional level because people have been trafficked for other things not only for sex work specific. So then in that way, that then um, creates that power of uh, other feminist movements that they think sex workers, every person is a sex worker traffic, which is not true. So we strongly feel that um, an effective um, partnership would be to work together as women, you know, regardless of the profession of who am I, but because I am a woman, I should be uh, allowed the space to participate in that kind of space and also to speak uh, for myself and my other colleagues that are self-identified, as I said earlier on, within the industry, and also to be able to differentiate the trafficking and sex work because those are two different things. So thanks, Colleen. I wanted to come at that from a from a different direction, which is also to say that I think that is that we, I, I think in most places in the world, are um, taught to think in binaries or in opposites. So we talk about consent or coercion as if these are completely separated from each other, which, and um, we use concepts in service of our ideology. So. What, we, what we've seen quite often is, um, as we talk to our feminist colleagues and um, women's rights allies, is this idea that, um, it, and I, I think probably a deeply paternalistic view, that, well, 
we will pity sex workers because they have had to make the choice out of because they are constrained, right? So that's the kind of best case scenario. Um, and as if we aren't all constrained, as if we don't all make choices within conditions of constraint, because of course we do, and yet that the ideological spin on that sets that as the decision-making parameters of, of sex workers, which not only is paternalistic and, and insulting, but it also serves to separate movements. Um, so then sex workers are kind of categorically different from all other workers all or all other human rights defenders. So I think it's really important for us to also look at the way that we use those concepts um, as ideologies that serve our own perspectives rather than really challenging those from the ground up. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, it's interesting because sometimes when we're talking, um, when we talk to uh, some of the potential allies um, and they, they hear us and sort of agree with us and they might go off and hear a different perspective from a different feminist organisation and give that equal weight to the voices of sex workers, like somehow these are two equal oppositional positions, um, whereas, you know, we're talking about the lives and reality and impact on sex workers versus, well, this is what I think that might be happening to sex workers. And somehow these are given equal weight and, you know, it's, it sort of feels like if we're not kind of in the spaces able to speak about our issues um, constantly, that it, uh, the conversation seems to decline very quickly. And it's not, I think it's understandable because that is the overwhelming narrative about sex work. And until that work is done to kind of unpack those stereotypes and misconceptions by actually listening to sex workers and their representative organisations, um, obviously you're constantly bombarded with those um, other messages and uh, which um, uh, sort of easier to believe, they, they kind of feed into, uh, you know, existing sexist, um, xenophobic, racist uh, narratives that we all have, I suppose, and we all have to work to unpack. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes um, it's, it's people need to have that space to do that and to hear from sex workers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yo creo que el principal desafío que hay que hacer con las feministas revolucionistas es que se pongan en nuestros zapatos, que ellas no pueden hablar por nosotros y lo hablan porque no lo han vivido. Somos nosotras las que tenemos que hablar realmente y son nuestras voces las que se tienen que posicionar. Que no nos vean como víctimas porque no nos sentimos víctimas. No, hemos tomado la decisión de hacer el trabajo sexual como opción laboral como una opción que nos permite vivir, que nos permite salir adelante. Y lo otro es que ellas deberían ayudarnos a fortalecer mucho más nuestras voces, en vez de tratar de apagarnos y tomar decisiones por nosotras. Y que nos permita eh, que nos piden como sujetas de derecho, como ciudadanas sujetas de derecho, no como niñas que son ellas las que van a venir a tomar decisiones en nuestras vidas. Um, so for Karina, the main challenge is to make abolitionists and abolitionist feminists put themselves in sex workers' shoes and to recognize that they haven't lived the experience of sex workers, that they should give space to sex workers' voices and not look at us as victims because sex workers, they don't feel as victims. We decided to engage in sex work as a labor option as an option to move forward and they should strengthen our voices instead of erasing us and recognizing that we are subjects that own their own rights. Okay, so that was the sort of the question about challenges and the next set of questions um, that are coming in are about solutions. So, um, so the next question I'll, I'll ask is, um, what, what are the most effective strategies in, in feminist alliance building? And what recommendations um, do you have in terms of shifting power and giving up power and changing the way funding and resources are allocated? Yeah, um, I think um, 
in, in terms of, uh, it, it, you know, it does make really a big difference to have other um, feminist organisations um, that are supporting of sex workers. And in fact, that what we found um, in, in our law reform campaigns, it made a really uh, big difference actually having the amnesty statement brought a, a lot of people to the table. And in fact, one of the politicians that was supporting uh, the campaign used to work for amnesty. So, you know, it had that sort of credibility in that regard. But actually once uh, a couple of the uh, women's organisations joined on board, it kind of gave courage to the other women's organisations to also realise that this was an issue and something that, that they should be supporting. Um, so, and then once we had like many of the feminist organisations on there, it was, you know, it, it just it just continued to grow. So that was uh, really important um, to actually have those brave organisations to begin with that were willing to uh, sort of put themselves out and, and step up and support sex workers. So I think that that was um, a, a move. And actually it took, I mean, it took work to get to that point. So we were actually having a fair few meetings, going over there and having conversations and bringing those resources along as well and uh, bringing along the evidence um, and uh, to, um, to, to show them that actually this is something that is supported. It's, there is global recognition around the fact that, um, that decriminalisation is a necessary uh, and uh, uh, the best model of regulation um, and uh, it, it, um, once we kind of got a couple of the organisations on board it just kind of stepped up from there. I think for me I would say from my understanding feminist that is about um, women having control of, of their choices you know so therefore as I said earlier on that, that regardless of occupation or decision or choice that I've made I still feel that I should be inclusive and be included and be meaningful in that kind of space. So for me, I would say it's one of the strategies first that um, the feminist movement that are not actually in support of who we are, they should firstly um, accept that um, sex workers are existing and sex workers are women and sex workers are parents. Because if we don't shift that perception first, it will not be easy to do other work that we want to do in partnership, etc. But we need to shift that perspective and understand exactly sex workers who they are and making sure that in every platform where uh, a sex work is discussed, we create a space for sex work, self identified sex workers to come and speak about the issues and also to guide on how best uh, women that are exploited out there besides sex workers that are exploited or women that are being trafficked, women in general that are being exploited, how can they be supported? Because when you're talking about the issues of women, um, anything that is related to women or affecting women, it also affects us as sex workers. So then I believe that that would be the first, uh, first strategy. And, uh, um, and also to make sure that some of the opportunities are given to sex workers to lead as women. For an example, I make an example of, I spoke about the ACG coalition that he, um, we are part of the steering committee. The ACG themselves, they decided that the four steering committee partners are organizations that work directly with sex workers. So therefore, to address issues for sex workers, it would be easy because we are funded and supported to do that kind of work. And then the 74 organizations that are part and parcel of the uh, ACG coalition are providing other support, external support, and maybe for an example, um, I would say uh, around HIV for an example. We don't do HIV within our movement, but then we refer those HIV related matters to those organizations. So therefore, I strongly feel that that the structure of the coalition of ERCG, it is a similar structure of the feminist movement, which then I think those kind of uh, strategies, I think that they can be adapted. Because now in South Africa, that has also shifted the mind of the community because some of the organizations are, are not working with sexual affairs, but they felt the importance of being part of the ACG coalition to support the issues of sex workers because they understand that regardless of who sex workers are they and what profession or decision they've made, but they should be protected and supported because 
they are human beings and they deserve to be treated equally just like any other person. I think that those are some, those are kind of like a couple of things that I think we need to start um, uh, paving at that level before we start thinking big, because if that perception is not shifted, then there will be still that stigma that is attached uh, within um, a sex work industry and the confusion of the confiliation. So those are some of the areas that we need to clear up as part of strategy in order to understand of who is trafficked, who is not trafficked, who uh, chose and decided to be in the industry, and how can you support those? Because I strongly feel that if um, we continue to confuse, conflate the two, then investing where there's no problem. Because now, sex workers are being targeted, which we chose and we made the decision to be there. And why are you targeting me? You know, we should be investing to women out there that they need this kind of support. Thank you. I'll just, just jump in there, like I think like what Colleen was speaking about, um, about sharing that space and making sure that when you're actually going to meetings or feminist um, collectives and they're talking about sex work or, it, you know, it is a kind of the issues that, that there are sex workers there and spaces made for sex workers um, to be um, invited because uh, a lot of the times we're not included in those forums. And I, I noticed that I or Asia Pacifica are on the uh, list of participants. I just want to shout out to them because, uh, you know, they've, they've been really great in ensuring that APNSW have been invited to forums, um, feminist forums and discussions um, that are happening and that, that are, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that um, those sex worker issues are being represented in that forum. I will make an example of um, a case that I'm attending now. It was referred yesterday. I won't mention where in which province, but I think it's a good example of this case. Because see, we are part of civil society, we are recognized since 2011, we are part of the 18 sectors in the civil society. So there's a WhatsApp group that is formed for sector leader representative. And then there were two sex workers that uh, moved to another province to go work in another province. And then when they get into the place, it's an escort agent, sort of. But I think that they were robbed of their belongings. And it has to, the way it, the case was presented to me, I strongly felt that the owner of the escort agent had a, a say and, a, and had a hand in breaking of their rules because their IDs were stolen and their money was stolen. But then how are we going to support that case? Because of the civil society, I don't know how they get to know about this case. They reflect the matter. So those are kind of system that will be able to work because if we are being alerted of this issue and then we can attend to it. Like as we speak now, the two ladies are in our office, they've been supported, and then they, they themselves said that they were in traffic, they came to work. Now we are in the process of making sure that we transport them back to their homes, but they've gotten the ID books. What they wanted is then to assist them to open the case because they want, they felt that they need to open the case because there was also um, some drug issue there. They were forced to do those kind of things. So, which is why we're calling for the adult. I mean, we're calling for decriminalization of other sex work because none of those we believe that uh, uh, would be still happening because the decrim is about expecting it. Uh, I mean, accepting and protecting the rights of, 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 of people. So, what I'm, the point that I'm trying to highlight is that uh, if we're in those kind of structures, if there's an alert of any crime or any danger, we communicate in those structures and then you see how we intervene as the sexual alert. So that's the role that we play. And even if it was um, someone who's been forced, we would have also attended the case because we're not ignoring those cases because we strongly feel that women should be supported in every danger that they are in. And then, um, do either of you want to turn to speak to that? The question on, um, Recommendations for shifting and giving up power. I give up cards that they, como dije antes, hay que hacer que las feministas revolucionistas se pongan en nuestros zapatos y que entiendan. Esto no se no se trata de luchar mujeres contra mujeres, sino encontrar puntos en común. Yo creo que tenemos que participar en los espacios donde estén muchas feministas y también hablar nuestro discurso, que ellas nos escuchen. Creo que no nos están escuchando y eso hay que lograr que ellas nos escuchen. Luego hacer abogacía, incidencia. Ellas están luchando contra la trata. 
nosotros también no estamos de acuerdo contra la trata, porque sabemos que tenemos hijos, hermanos, familia, que en algún momento también van a estar en el cuido en eso, podrían estar en el cuido en eso, y que hemos sido pioneras en luchar contra la trata. Entonces, lo fundamental acá es que nos escuchen, participar en los espacios, encontrar puntos en común que nos unen a las mujeres también, ¿no? Eso es lo fundamental. Ok. So in regards to strategies to encourage feminists, again, she will highlight the importance of putting feminists into, uh, to make uh, feminists think about how to be sex workers' shoe, uh, shoes. Uh, a, a fundamental strategy is to participate in feminist uh, spaces where sex workers need to be heard and uh, to make and to make them understand that we both sex workers and feminists can work on several advocacy fronts together including trafficking because sex workers they also don't agree with tra trafficking they don't want to put themselves in a vulnerable position they don't want to put their kids in a vulnerable position and the feminists must recognize that sex workers have been pioneers in creating strategy to fight against trafficking Yeah, maybe maybe I'll, in the interest of time, I'll try to be brief, but I guess coming at this question from a funder perspective, uh, you know, I think as uh, feminist funders and funders of feminist movements, I think we can, we can take a good look at, uh, you know, how inclusive our uh, funding strategies are, where sex workers are in among organizations uh, that's, and organizations and projects that we support. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, at least if, you know, I understand, of course, that, you know, many funders have their own priorities, but at the very least, I think what we can aspire to do is to do no harm to sex workers. That should be a, a fundamental principle, I think, of any feminist funder. Mm -hmm. I think what I forgot to highlight in case you might be confused about the case that I'm making an example of is that the owner of the escort he promised to pay the sex workers money back and then when they keep asking and then they were kicked out. So the point that I'm trying to highlight is that sex workers still they can be still exploited if even if they chose to be in the industry. So which is why we are advocating for um sex work to be decriminalized because even if you're in the industry, you can be exploited. Um, so that's what I was trying to, to highlight in case you might ask you what was the purpose of making the, the reference of the case. All right, so I'll read the next question now. This question, um, is, there's a clear role for allies in movement building. Should allies have a plan for how to incrementally stop occupying certain spaces, no longer be a link between donors and sex worker-led organizations, and in effect give up certain powers and privileges that could force them to change the terms of their size, power, and resources. Um, so the question was asked um, for, for Susanna to, uh, to answer about Priya's approach, and then as well, um, anyone else can answer as well. Thanks, it, it's a great question. And the answer is yes, of course we need that plan. Uh, you know, I, I wish we were talking about a five-year plan. I fear that we're not that close. Um, but at CREA, one of the principles we work by is using the access we have to for other folks to occupy that space. So I think that that's a really important principle of um, empathic allyship, if you will, that we do have access. There are um, there are global venues that we know quite well that we've been built relationships in um, where we know how to be effective advocates and it is both important to share that knowledge and information through training and it's also really important to use those resources for us to step back and make that space available to folks who can speak on behalf of their own experiences and that's true for sex worker rights advocates. It's true we do a lot of work with uh, women living with disability. Uh, again, what we try to do is support folks to go to the national meetings or the regional meetings or the global meetings. Karina, we supported Karina to go to the um, 
Beijing 25 Latin America Regional Meeting, for instance. So we take really seriously our responsibility to, to both be good, strong advocates, and not just as allies, because we are a feminist human rights organization that that advocates for inclusive feminism, and that it's an inclusive feminism, that it is inclusive of sex workers, not just as an advocate for sex workers' rights, which of course it ought to be, but that, uh, you know, we, we don't, we have as a goal that as a movement, the movement has the participation of lots of different kinds of feminists. I, you know, I noted that Coley from the beginning talked about um, not just sex workers and feminists, but uh, but claim the claim the identity as a feminist. I think that's also really important. So how do we think about our movements? We talk about cross movement organizing understanding, really important. But ultimately, what we want are movements that are themselves inclusive of the folks who. Um, who we might have been advocating on behalf of strange and constructed sense. But I think um, I think the you get the point. And and yes, of course that means as a as an organization with access to resources, access to national, regional and global spaces, we need to uh, we need to start thinking about how do we shape and change our own institution so that it backs off when backing off becomes possible. But like I said, I, I look forward to that day and, and fear we're, um, we're still a ways away from that. But, but absolutely, and thanks for the question. Does anyone else want to speak on that? I think that's very well answered. I mean, I think for all of us that we hope for the day that our work's no longer needed, you know, like, in a way, it's a, uh, if, you, if we, we're doing it right, we're doing ourselves out of a job, you know. Uh, but um, yeah, unfortunately, we're a long way from there. But um, yeah. I think I'll ask, um, we've just a few minutes left, so I'll ask one more question and maybe everyone can can just give any final quick wrapping up thoughts because we just have a couple minutes. But um, one other question is, is basically what can what can feminists, what can civil society do to advance um, sex workers' human rights? So feel free to. Can, can I just? I mean, I think I just answered that. Right. But uh, you know, again, just to reiterate the point that sex workers' human rights are human rights, and human rights are all of our human rights. Um, so we need to pay attention to those who who are being excluded from those rights, but. Um, ultimately, you know, it's kind of working toward the world that works us out of business. Ultimately, if we are feminists, if we are a human rights movement, we are inclusive movements, and uh, and that certainly should be the goal that we aspire to, knowing that we're still some way away from that. I think for me, on um, feminist uh, movement. It's inclusive, meaningful of the age of people that are affected, like it's women. So we should be in those, invited to, 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 to participate in those spaces where it's, it's, it's free stigma and discrimination. Um, and also I make an example of how are we involved in South Africa on civil society structures. Uh, we involved from provincial, wide, locally, district to national. So then that has then it's, um, given us an agent and confident to, 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 to participate in such spaces and also to guide on how implementations that are successful can actually work successfully be achieved. For an example, the, the human rights plan that I spoke about, it is not specifically looking into sex workers only, but it is addressing the barriers of the key population in South Africa. We are also now developing the toolkit which has been part and parcel of their processes. So that, I believe, is the way to go. Primero, ¿qué tiene que hacer la sociedad? Romper con los paradigmas, estigma y discriminación de las sujetas ciudadanas que somos las mujeres trabajadoras del sector. 
vernos como ciudadanos de igual a igual. So for her, since she has to be very short, a civil society must break with paradigms that promote the stigma and discriminations against sex workers, and really start to recognize as citizens who are deemed with rights. I mean, I guess what I would say is just, um, I mean, again, like I said before, to really, really think deeply about kind of where sex workers are in relation to, you know, all the struggles that we are engaged in. Um, and also, I think, you know, recognizing that a lot of human rights uh, violations that, that many sex workers experience have kind of structural causes. To, so to also think about that, and which I think means that like intentions are not the only thing. Like we need to also think about kind of what the consequences of our our actions are, even when the intentions might be good. And I think you know it, it, it's been understanding that, that these are issues that, that we, we share. You know the issues that we face are you know issues of sexism and a lack of rights. That, that um, also uh, women's rights issues are also sex worker rights issues. Um, and uh, understanding that we all kind of want respect, we want our right to choose, we want respect of our agency and autonomy, and to self organise. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I wish I think we could keep talking for you know more time, but we're out of time. Um, so just um, to end, a huge, enormous thanks to all of the speakers. That we have today. And we have to end a thank you to the Global Network of Sex Work Project, and <laughs> and a thank you to all of you online. Um, who we know are watching and uh, wish we could be with you in person, but this is the best we can do. And um, hopefully this um, recording will be made available and we can all continue this conversation in other ways online or in person in the future. So thank you so much. <laughs>